In this episode, I speak with Justin Chancellor, bass player of Tool. We're very excited and fortunate to talk with Justin, especially in light of the fact that Tool is just releasing Fear Inoculum, their first album in 13 years. So we'll cover a lot of ground. We dive into the Tool songwriting process, how Justin records his bass, and after being one of the last holdouts, his thoughts on releasing Tool's music on streaming. We'll talk about how almost 25 years ago, Justin was asked to join Tool, but almost didn't do it. We'll get that story and much more. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Justin Chancellor. Justin Chancellor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. Before we get to the new album, I want to go back in time briefly. I know you joined the band in 1995. That's correct. I want to back up just a couple of years for some context. This was a pretty pivotal time, early 90s, for rock music in general. You see the underground rising up in a lot of places. You see bands that previously didn't fit the popular mold breaking through to large audiences. We have the grunge scene, the punk scene breaking through. And the metal scene is changing. And I see Tool not necessarily fitting nicely into one of these genres, but definitely part of this, this overall landscape. I remember I saw, first came across Tool on MTV with the sober video, yeah. as most people probably did if, mm-hmm. if you're old enough. And, and it, was, it felt new, it felt almost eerie and, and edgy, not just the music, but the, uh, the imagery in the video. So initially you were playing in a band called Peach, touring with Tool at this point. Well, not quite touring, but we did a oh. few shows. Like oh, okay. That's the connection originally, though. Yeah. Okay. It was more of a favor than, you know, <laughs> okay. than an earned spot. Okay. So I'm just curious how you viewed this era. Did it feel like there was change in the air? Did it feel at the time like you were on the ground floor of something big? Well, yeah. I mean, I was actually, for the first time, really pursuing being in a band full time, you know. I went to university for a few years until I realized I was done with, you know, being, you know, in the whole, uh, you know, the dead end of education as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Um, So I quit and I moved to London and I was in a band full time. But before that, I remember, I guess, you know, Guns N' Roses came out with Appetite for Destruction. There was Nirvana, Nevermind. Um, all that stuff was pretty huge at the time that I left my my college, I guess you call it in America. Yeah. University. Yeah. And it was probably about 92 Somewhere in 92 or 93. I was just starting to get into heavier stuff. Um, I was really into The End of Silence by the Rollins Band in that yeah. moment. And coincidentally, Tool ended up touring with them. Basically, I, I was uh, very excited about being in a band. It was A lot of it was more in my kind of uh, taste spectrum, you know. Um, so when I moved to London, I'd already been playing with Peach. Um, we were actually a little more relevant than we may have been a few years before and our mixture was um kind of indie i was into a lot of that shoegazing stuff that was going on yeah um it was more of like a a mixture between indie and and heavy like i was into the heavier stuff and a couple of the other guys like the kind of more my bloody valentine kind of thing so it actually accidentally kind of worked at the time a little bit yeah Um, yeah you know we didn't have a great success but yeah, it was, uh, it was exciting to be creating something that you believed in that was very organic from, you know, the four of us. And it actually was in a way relevant because if it had been 10 years before, it would have had to be one or the other, you know? Sure, right, right. Okay, so, so 1995, Paul Diamor exits the band. Demore, exits, yeah. Demore? Yeah. Okay, exits Tool. Yeah. And then, so what happens from there? So I basically got a call. Um, I got told that there was a, a call at my flat. I think I was actually doing a gig with Peach. Um, you got to call the guys from Tool back. And uh, at this point, they'd been really courteous to us as friends. I mean, that's a, a bit more of a backstory, but we'd done a couple of shows supporting them in London. You know, when they did their London shows, they asked Peach to support them. So, um, and we'd also gone to LA with the help of some of their people and done four shows in LA as oh, Peach. Okay which was incredibly exciting. You could still smoke on a plane back then. So I remember (laughs) sitting in the back smoking cigarettes all the way to LA and ordering (laughs) drinks. Just all of the four of us were excited about it. Um, So anyway, I got the call. Uh, I called them back quite nervous. You know, I'm like, what are they, what do they want? You know? And it was Maynard and he, he, uh, or it was, I think it was Maynard, but he, they were like, we'd like you to come out and uh, audition to be in the band, you know? And it was a little too much really to absorb and take in and uh 
I think right on that first call, I basically immediately just said, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, you know. Um, out of total fear, you know, yeah. and just intimidation. Um, again, the details are a little sketchy at this point in time, but... yeah. Um, so anyway, I said, I, I, essentially I said, uh, thanks very much. It's really nice of you, but I don't think so. You know, I'm too, way too busy here. So were you guys oh. interacting a lot on those shows when you played together? Did oh, well, you guys yeah, hit it yeah, off? Yeah, we yeah. were kind of friends before. Um, we sort of, uh, my brother was friends with the guy that signed to all, Matt Marshall. They okay. met randomly in America years before, but they both ended up in, in the music industry, yeah. in, working for record companies. So when Matt signed Tool, we heard about Tool. Almost the first people in England got to get the demo tape. So when they came over and doing really well, we actually took them out to the pub and stuff and hung out with them. And that's how we first met and became friends. It was very non-musical in a way. Yeah. Sort of showed them around town or whatever. So yeah, I, 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 I turned it down at first. And then uh, basically my brother, I told my brother somehow, and he literally got on the tube and came over to my flat and just started like yelling at me. I was like, <laughs> you're out of your mind, you know. I mean, a part of it was that I was very determined. I was writing music with this band. I'd left university to pursue this, to be in a band. And I was very committed to it as well. So that was part of the reason that I wasn't going to, gonna, you know, just suddenly just get up and leave. Like sort of a, almost like a, for a moral reason, you know. Yeah. And, uh, just the integrity of what we were doing. But um, he, my brother said, look, this is crazy, man. You've got to do this. You've got to try it. Like, you're not even... He's like, what does it matter, you know, even if you, uh, even if you fail? Like, what a great thing to be asked to do and you have to go and try. So yeah. I didn't in any way feel musically uh, on a level with them, you know. That entails uh, a moving to a new country too. So Absolutely. So no small step. Not a small step at all. And... Um, and, you know, I mean, I wasn't, things weren't amazing, but I was pretty happy to be in this zone of, like, not being stuck in, like, this endless thing of education and, like, um, you know, whatever I was learning, English and history and Russian studies, you know, like, where am I going, you know, and all I was doing was obsessed with music. So I was in a happy place in London, you know, I was, like, on the dole, I was like, yeah, I'm finally one of the people, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just... Uh, Part of it was a bit of a shock, you know. I thought we would get, we were really going somewhere. I was actually, I got to clarify this actually. Peach had finished by that stage, and we'd started a new band. I believe our our singer Simon had had left to go and he was a geography uh, professor. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, he'd he'd sort of like packed it in, and we'd ended up me and Ben Derling, my guitar player, who I was at school with. Um, we ended up creating a new band called Sterling and we'd actually been offered a record deal by Beggar's Banquet. So we, it was quite exciting at the time and it was new. So that was another quite intense thing that we'd actually got somewhere and we'd been offered a deal and I'd uh, now been offered this thing, you know, so I just, it was it was almost too easy just to say, no, I can't, you know, I'm really, like, right. I, I've got a deal, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah. But my brother really was like this, because he knew how much it meant to me and how much I liked the band. And, and uh, so I had the, I had the, you know, difficult thing of uh, basically calling them back and saying, uh, would it be all right if I changed my mind, you know, <laughs> and come out, which everybody will tell you is not something that would normally work, you know. People were like, no, 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 you've, you know, you made your choice. Yeah. Or they'd already have moved on, you know. Anyway, they they were really cool and they said yes. So that, you know, that's pretty much how that's I awesome. ended up coming out, yeah. And you come in basically when they're recording Anima? Uh, they, they'd written about three and a half songs for, okay. for Anima. So you were part of the writing process on that oh, album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, so they, uh, they sent me, when I said, okay, I'm going to come, and they set up a, you know, they got me a flight and they said, you're going to come out for a week come and audition. So they sent me three and a half songs on a demo tape. And I remember sitting on the tube in London, just like, whoa, you know, I've got the new tool stuff. And, <laughs> and it, to be honest, it was very, really quite crazy to listen to. It was like Push It and uh, Eulogy, and, but very broken down. Almost, I don't think it had any words on it or anything. Um, even Enema had like the whole end bit. Um, just nuts. But I had to sort of get my head around it and learn it a little bit. And then the other deal was you got to bring some stuff out with you, you know, that you've written. Anything, anything you've got to bring to the table is 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 welcome. And uh, and I got kicked out of my band, 
because they as soon as I told them I was going for this audition, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were like fireworks, and you know everyone got really upset. Well, it's so, great knowing there was room for you. That they're bringing in someone to write too. It's yeah, not yeah, just yeah. a hired gun. You're coming in to uh, yeah. be part of the process. Absolutely, and that was part of their their deal. They're like the, I, they actually explained that to me. They said, "Well, the reason." that you came up was because you're, you know, you create and you write music as well. We like your bass playing, you know, you got a great look. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but we want, you know, we want someone, we need someone that actually is involved in the writing process. We need a contributor to the songs. Um, so when I was sitting in uh, Archway, I'd moved again to North London. I was getting ready to go out there, but I was assuming that the future was looking pretty open, you know, because I would have didn't have a band anymore. There's no way I'm going to get the tour gig. So I'm sitting there writing music frantically for my new project. And I was excited, actually. I was, like, really stoked. I'm like, okay, now I'm finally going to get to do exactly what I want to do, and I'm going to put it together. And I was had this period for those two weeks of just really focusing on the future. And uh, I actually... But I wrote the riff for 46 and 2 in that period. Oh, wow. And uh, I ended up bringing that with me. And that was one of the first things that me and Adam wrote together once I joined. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So all the Tool fans have to thank your brother for giving you a little nudge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, so that was 1995. So you guys are almost 25 years of, of the same lineup, which is rare and impressive. Yeah. Um, Bands as, are as in, rare as a dog that speaks Norwegian. <laughs> yes. Uh, wrap your head around that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, bands are inherently difficult. Uh -huh. And uh, do you have any advice for, for people in bands trying to keep the peace? How, how did you guys survive differences? I'm sure you guys have had differences through the years, like yeah, any yeah. band. How, yeah. how do you get through all that stuff? I mean, there's many, many answers to that. But I mean, fortunately, we're... Everything is split four ways. We're four equal members. Nobody calls the shots. Everything's done by vote, you know, support bands, what songs, what, you know, everything is, is a, a, I guess you'd call it a democracy. Yeah. Um, which is which, kind of, go ahead. No, you, oh, I was going to say, which is kind of what's hard about a band. It's like running a company with four or five that's very hard. bosses. I was, I was or, about to yeah. say that. It is, that does make it very hard too. So you can have one, one guy in charge, and then three people that are happy to be there. You're doing really well, and they. But they maybe that's a little creatively uh, suffocating, you know. Or if if you are creative, I mean, I guess some people are happy to do that, you know. But just the way it worked out makes it actually really difficult, and also really gives it a great lifespan, I think. Yeah. Um, but for us to this date now, I mean, it's so exciting that we're about to release our album on Friday, you know. Um, that was probably the hardest period to come through when you're all getting older and you've had success, you know, to, to a good degree. Everyone's thinking about maybe doing their own things, you know. I mean, Maynard's done a bunch of his own things as well, or, you know, things yeah. with other, other people. And so there could be a point where it's like, well, what, what is it worth it? You know, is it, you know, do I want to move on? But I think everyone realizes that. You know, this is completely unique. It's as good as it gets. And when you're 25 years in or 20 years in, it's like you're pretty much, you know, quite a bit of the way through your lifespan, you know. And to think that you've you've been part of something very unique like this is uh, something to be to be cherished and 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 kept very sacred, you know. So uh, another thing is just to you know, everyone. It's a, it's a tough one because we're all artists, musicians, whatever. Keep your, your your egos in check. You know, once you're, you start getting running carried away with your ego, and you start to think that it's all about you. You know, it's like your thing, and then you'll find out very quickly when you go off on your own. Uh, it's not quite as good as when I was with those other guys, is it? <laughs> Maybe you, they had a great part to do with it. You know, and, oh, and like you can, I know this for a fact because I've, you know, I try to write stuff on my own. And even the stuff that we we write as a band, if I'd have written it myself, it would it wouldn't go down the way it goes down with these guys. It needs them, it needs the opposites to temper each other, you know. So I have to ask: Have you seen Bohemian Rhapsody? I have. Yeah. So there's a, a great scene where when Freddie goes solo and yeah. then he rejoins the band and yeah, he comes yeah, yeah, back yeah. and says, yeah. well, "I did the solo thing. Everyone did exactly what I wanted them to. They play, they played yeah, the parts. Yeah. Yeah. The truth is." 
I need you guys. I need your annoying criticism. I need Brian May to rework my parts. And in the, the end, best part of the movie, I thought. Yeah, yeah. that was great. And it, and it so. I mean, it's a cliche for sure, but I think it and, it and it and it simplifies the whole thing a little bit. But it is the truth, you know. Those that that alchemy of like when it works. In we're talking about oh, anything, but like we're talking about music and bands. You can't make that up, you know. And like, yeah. if I'd have joined the band and it hadn't worked, it wouldn't have worked. You know what I mean? So you have to even like appreciate that, you know. Yeah. That that wow, okay. By calling them back and going for it, that was that would never have happened. You know, the the band would have been a completely different thing. I'm not saying it wouldn't have been successful, but like the fact that it was, you got to really cherish that and really take it seriously. Yeah. And if you want to be doing music all your life and be happily successful and and you know and make a living out of it you can't just treat it you know you can't just think you're the shit and just kind of do whatever you want you have to really see the path you've come down and respect it you know yeah yeah all right we're going to take a quick break and then come back and talk about the new album today's episode is brought to you by the ernie ball axis capo featuring a dual radius design that conforms to both curved and flat fretboards ensuring buzz free play Quick single-handed operation allows for fast and accurate key changes. Available in four finishes, get your Ernie Ball Axis Capo at your favorite guitar store today. Check out the show notes for more details. Okay, the new album, Fear Inoculum. And uh, quick FYI for our listeners, we're actually recording this podcast a few days before the release of the album, and the podcast will likely come out just after Fear Inoculum is released. So if I sound as if I haven't heard the album... It's because I haven't heard the album yet. <laughs> All right. So Fear Inoculum, pretty big deal tool releasing an album at this point. You guys have, have sort of reached this, this upper echelon of rock bands, critically acclaimed, super fans across the, the globe, uh, Grammys. I would assume that status sort of carries some, a little pressure when you're releasing new material. Add to that, that anticipation for this album has been building for, for 13 years. Is that true? Did you do you guys feel a little more pressure this time than than maybe you would in the past to get things just right? Um, I think so. Yeah, the first time I was involved in an album doing Enema, as we were just talking about earlier, it was just full steam ahead, no looking back. Nothing had really been. I mean, not nothing had been achieved, but like for me, it was just right in at the deep end. There's no time to second guess, you know. Yeah. And uh, people are going, that's great, that's great. Keep moving, keep moving. And much quicker process, you know. So for sure, this time, I think there were moments where you have this kind of uh, fear <laughs> that uh, that perhaps you kind of like self-imploded a little bit and the purity of what was good about what you were doing as the four of you is has been compromised a little bit by overthinking and, you know, over-calculating everything. And I, I think... Uh, the, the pressure is is more about wanting to do something pure and honest from from the four of us rather than what we think should be produced you know um of course you want people to like it but i don't think i don't think that was really ever ever a pressure i think people would appreciate the work that goes into it and i think the way that we work and the way that people play their instruments and interact i think it would have always been um, had value and have been interesting you know like you, there's lots of bands where they got this weird album where it came out towards the end of their career and people are like well, that's the weird one but it still has a part in their history you know sure and it's appreciated by the people that like them and maybe by some people that never really were in it might, it might open up to other people you know um, so I think we have confidence in ourselves but I think just to try and achieve something that we'd achieved naturally in the past you know by not really thinking about it this time we were kind of going all right how did that work again you know everyone's kind of gone gone away from each other a little bit and it's not quite as natural you know to, when you come back together to just pull that off um and that you know it's a little more calculated and and i think the time it took reflects that you know we had to kind of break that back down we had to explode a few times and yeah, and start from scratch again. I was wondering about that. There have been a few pronouncements through the years that the album is is almost done or it would be released a certain year. Yeah. Were there times that you you were actually close and then went back and, and scrapped completed songs? Or, well, I or, mean, there were times where it felt like we were on the way, you know, like we had, uh, and uh, just so you understand, there were never full songs written. Okay. Um, but there was, there was a great body of work that we were working on um, some of which followed through into what we have now, um, but 
a bunch of it didn't make it, you know. And as a as a whole body of work, that's we were kind of working on these piles of ideas at the same time. And you start to have a, a we all see it differently, but you start to have an a image of how the whole thing is going to look if you could make it into an image or a landscape, you know. Um, and I know for myself, I would get really excited about it. I'm like, okay, and then we have this idea here that's going to like completely add that to it um, and complete the whole picture. But other people are having different ideas, you know, so maybe that was a different way that we worked that didn't work, you know. Like I think before we were a bit more like one song, the next song, the next song. Um, we kind of worked a little more chronologically like that. Just, just It was just different, and uh, I think... Almost like we had to get back to basics a few times and go, you know what, let's just concentrate on one thing. And uh, who likes, you know, who likes what? Which, which, which idea are we all into? Okay, let's start working on that. After ha- having, you know, a month away from each other. Yeah, no, I was wondering at that because your previous album, um, 10,000 Days, was released in 2006. So yeah. with, with that time span, I'm sure you guys had a ton of ideas built up to sift through. Did you guys have a ton of ideas banked? And, and if so... Was there a process to go through all these different ideas? You mean before we started writing this? Yeah, and as you're writing, I guess. Yeah, we. Yeah. I mean, we do. We we all have accumulating ideas the whole time. You know, there's stuff on this album that was written before I was in the band. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's riffs that Adam had that we included on songs on this album. But even while we're writing, we're all individually coming up with ideas, and you know, like the old iPhone's great for that now. Okay. Yeah. You know. Um, I've got shitloads on my computer. Um, there's so much to go through. And Adam's a real advocate of that. I'm, I'm sort of like, I, I put my head down, I just keep going forward. And I'm really excited about the next thing, the next thing, you know. And yeah, I, yeah. I, have a, I have a kind of personal philosophy that if I wake up in the morning and the idea's gone, you know, unless I recorded it, if I wake up the next day and it's gone, it was never good enough to, to, to stay, you know. Um, and also a confidence that there's going to be something amazing coming up next. You know, you, you're making room for a new right. idea. Adam's got a bit more of a philosophy that, you know, that. Do you remember that thing you wrote? That was great. Do you remember? And it, and I won't remember. He'll play it to me. He go, "This is great. We've got to use this," and almost like a bank of ideas. You know, so combined, there'd be you know, we we get frustrated with each other because he'd be we'd be working on something from an old idea. And I'd suddenly have a new idea, you know, like, what about if it did this? And get really, really excited about it. And the rest of the guys are like, whoa, whoa, whoa you know, reel yourself in. Like, you know, just put that on the, on the side. Let's, we're working on this right now, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, I kind of get carried away with that, you know. Yeah. I guess that would be more of a prog rock thing, you know, just to kind of go off on a tangent. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't even remember where we started with the question, but that, yeah. yeah. No, this is all good. Um, where do most of your best ideas come from? Are there certain settings or scenarios that help you to have ideas pop into your head? Yeah, I mean, I talked to Tim about this when we did our Ernie Ball. The video. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the little, what would you call it? String theory. The string theory. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I like to, you know, I like to be outside. I like to, to dig in the soil. I like to hike and... I'm into sailing and, you know, getting in, just generally an outdoors type of person. And I do get a lot of ideas when I'm on my own out in nature, you know, walking around. Without a base around you, just Absolutely. in your head. It's always, yeah. it always, for me, I mean, if I, if, I, if I sit down and spend an evening, which is, is not all the time, on my own playing my bass, um, you know, I might have a few beers and, like, go down my studio and, and I'll come up with some ideas. Um, on you know melodic ideas on a, on an instrument, but most of the time, a lot of the ideas that make it onto tour records are kind of rhythmic um, and percussive. You know, they're beats that kind of come into my head when I'm walking around, and then after that, I'll apply melody to it. So I'll get a kind of crazy beat, gotcha, and then I'll yeah. count it out. Something driving normally that is you know you can count it however, but you figure a way to to cycle it. And then I'll go up and I'll apply some kind of melody to it, um, and normally too much melody, you know. And then, and then you like start subtracting stuff, but there's really a, it's really almost like a pulse, you know, that starts the whole thing. Yeah. So my impression from from what I've read is that you guys might have a riff or a chord progression, some song idea, 
and then you'll fairly exhaustively experiment with it from from every angle, yeah. whether it's I don't know beat tempo, even time signature yeah. instrumentation. Is, Wind is that chimes. is that true? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it always makes me laugh when you listen to the radio and people are doing interviews and they say, "Yeah, it took me like two minutes to write that song," or, or like there's this great wonderful thing about that. For us, it's not like that at all. I mean, I don't think that's ever happened. I don't know if it's happened for May maybe it's happened for Maynard writing lyrics. I don't know. Um, I've had a few little moments of writing, you know, do -do 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 -do, where I was like, okay, that's really cool, and it kind of comes out of nowhere in a way. It wasn't developed. Yeah. But as far as like writing a piece, um, we've always experimented every which way you want and maybe that's part of the reason the band's what it is you know because some of the parts i write end up being guitar parts or some of the parts adam writes end up being drum we'll even go like what's adam's guitar part let's uh, uh, danny play that on the drums just as a rhythm you know or even play it on the notes of your electronic pads and now adam can play something different and react to that is danny pretty instrumental in the no pun intended, within the process of, of your exper experimentation? and Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all just searching, wallowing around. We really enjoy playing together, you know what I mean? That's yeah. the best part of it. Um, so it's actually kind of fun experimenting with all that stuff. But it is a fact that if you do look around and you, and you mess around with the ideas, um, sometimes you can find something greater than the original thought you know then other times you'll come back to the original thought and it'll be so you're evident that it's the strongest thing you know that original basic percussive riff or whatever that you had you've tried to add layers to it you've had everyone else try and play it but in the end it comes back to what the original idea was and we'll do that as well but we'll exhaust every other avenue on the way to getting there yeah okay so this process we're, we're talking about right now is this fairly separate from the vocal process the music and the vocals uh yeah separate stages in the writing process yeah, yeah, yeah. it is yeah, yeah 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 we we you know the the band the, the the musicians well not that he's not a musician mainly but the the people playing instruments not the voice instrument uh, <laughs> <No> offense <laughs> like, singers <laughs> i'm like by eating my words um yeah that 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 process is exhausting for anyone that wants to write vocals over it because it keeps changing you know it's it's not even just the the melodies or the you know the the length of the song it's it's the whole structure of the song if you're trying to write a piece that's cohesive and poetic and uh express you know it's it's uh, full of language and, and thought if if the band keeps changing the ideas behind it it's really incredibly frustrating unless yeah. you're singing a pop song where you're like duh, 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 and you just keep repeating the same same words you know you can probably fit that over anything but uh yeah he he basically waits for us okay. to be you guys figure your shit out and then come yeah, talk to me yeah he's like don't even call me until you, you you know you you're set <laughs> on this yeah and we've done it we've been through that before where we you know we sent him something and then we carry on working on it and he's already started working on an idea and it's, you know, it's deeply emotional and sensitive and he's excited about it and then we'll send, we'll go, well, we changed this a little bit and it's, you know, that's it's kind of not cool. So we figured that out this time and also, in a way, that stretched it out even longer because suddenly we were like, all right, we've got to really be happy with this now before we send it to him. So we yeah, spent a couple right. more years like, oh, yeah. all right perfecting it or whatever because there's no turning back after that as far as we're concerned now is there anybody in the band who could be deemed the the biggest perfectionist oh, i don't think so no okay. i don't think so i think yeah. everybody's pretty much i don't think it's even perfection it's just uh just real like everyone's creative juices are flowing you know everyone has a you 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 get really excited about an outcome of an idea and you kind of get your heart set on it you know i mean i'm sure when people paint they're like oh, okay that's it but when there are four of us, everyone has a different perception of what that is. Um, so you kind of have to constantly let that go. You go like, you know, I, especially I'll come home from practice, I'll be like, it's per you know, it sounds so amazing. I can't believe we did that today. We put this bit with this bit and it's just everything I dreamed of. Within a week, I've got to <laughs> let that go. You know, I'll be sitting in my studio still listening to that CD like it was my little precious thing, oh, you know. Yeah, okay. But the song is gone. It's, it's changed completely. Because that wasn't everybody's idea, you know. Um, 
even Maynard would send vocals, which I was like, oh my, you know, this is amazing. This is so perfect over the music. On the album, it's completely different now. By the point we got to record, he'd changed what he wanted to hear from himself. So you have to kind of let that go constantly. Maybe a, a B-side album down the, down the way. Well, oh yeah. I mean, there's like... Reworked versions. I, I've got booklets and booklets of CDs. Of, you know, we, every day we recorded practice. So that, but, you know, maybe interesting to a super fan, but really tedious to listen to. But, I mean, you'll get an idea of how exhaustive the, you know, the process was of going through and over and over and, and trying different little increments of stuff. Sure. How about song titles? Is that solely the domain of Maynard? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, you know, the the lyrical content, it's all him. I mean, he'll react to the music. We'll talk about it sometimes. Um, like, we, we have a few get-togethers, like, a year before we record and stuff and go through what we're where we're at. But mostly he'll call for rhythm ideas, you know, or, like, have me, like, count out the... He won't quite understand how the rhythm of something goes, so I'll help counted out for him um but when it comes to the actual you know the the poetry of it it's all him you guys don't really weigh in on the lyrics you, you that's no, his thing no, you no, guys no. trust we him get, you know we get we he'll, he'll talk about it and then we'll it's real inspiring though because you'll start to see patterns and the way that it relates in numbers to to the words and stuff and we'll explore that and that kind of branches off into the artwork you can actually kind of that fuels the artwork a little bit because now you have a discussion about, whoa, that's crazy, you're singing about this, that you reacted to our music and sang this, and now I'm telling you that this is what the music is saying, like mathematically, you know. Wow, yeah. Um, and then you'll talk to Alex Gray, and he's like, well, I've been working on this painting that, you know. So, yeah. You mentioned artwork real quick. Are, yeah. are the rumors true? The uh, There's going to be a physical copy of the CD too, yeah. uh, with, equipped with a screen and speakers? That's correct. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's epic. <laughs> it's epic. It's so exciting. I'm actually getting a copy today, I think. So oh, wow. Okay. I'm excited about it. I've seen it. It's crazy. We might as well talk about videos. Are, yeah. are there videos, actual music videos for songs on that physical? No, no, no. Okay. No, no it's like, a, it's just part of the package, you know? It's like a, it's like a, I don't know how you would describe it. Almost like a billboard, like a moving billboard, but it's oh. an eight minute song. But it's it's loaded with... A couple tracks or a couple? No, no, no. no. Well, just, oh. just, just the one track. Okay, just yeah. the one track. But okay. it's not on the album. It's a oh, separate okay. thing. Okay. So you open it, you look at it, and okay. you listen to it. Are videos planned in the future? Yeah, we've okay. got, we, we're working on one, actually. So okay. it's, all, uh, it's all in in the works. And are these directed by, by Adam Jones, your guitar player? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of people working on them. We have, we've had some uh, footage that we haven't used for a while um, that we're trying to incorporate. Um, we've got um, a couple of other guys that do uh, CGI. Um, it's more, it's it's a bigger collaboration, I think, than it's mm. been. You'd have to ask Adam for specifics, but it's a, a bigger collaboration that's been before, um, and it's going to be a bit more of a mix of of media. Um, so it should be, yeah, there'll be video. That's It'll great, really cool. That's why you guys are a tool, blending the mediums. How do you see your role in the band? I'm the bass player. <laughs> <laughs> Just a I'm bass the player. Groover. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm a, I guess I'm a workhorse, you know, I just, I just, uh, I'm really proud to be able to write music and have a, have a, a place where I can write crazy stuff. I mean, I don't even really think about it. I just always thought these ideas would be cool if they were played by a drummer and a guitar player could play them with me. And it never really was the case. I was in a group of people where I could, I could pull that off. And this is a place where for the last 25 years, I've been able to come up with some crazy stuff. And Danny just looks at me and goes, yeah, and like just starts playing with me immediately. And, uh, you know, Adam loves it or he'll come up with something completely against it. And um, creatively, that's, 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 that was my dream, really. You know, you get a great idea and you want to just go, like, this is a great idea and play it to the world. But a lot of times people get pressured into just kind of molding it and conforming it a little bit to whatever everything else sounds like. Yeah. And I have the the lucky chance and, and, and uh, you know, the happy place of, of being able to just to do that freely, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying they like everything, but, uh, you know, I've, I've managed to get, there's some stuff on this album which I'm so excited about people hearing that's just really nuts, you know. That's but they, they, they help me make sense of it and make it, 
into something. Your bass playing is definitely su such a big part of the tool sound. One thing that, that stands out to me is the the clarity you get in your bass with especially with riffs that are kind of complicated or, or moving across different strings when bass bass can get messy and, and muddy so easily. Any uh, secrets you can divulge to, to people on, on how to <laughs> get that clarity either I don't know, technique or EQ effects? You know there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it but I definitely use a lot of I definitely when I record I, I give myself a lot of options I have a dirty amp I have a clean amp I have a, a direct signal um, I have a direct another direct this time I had four two direct signals one that had all the effects so it hit the DI and went through all the effects and the other one missed all the effects so you've always got a clean DI as well um, and then when you're mixing a certain part in a song when you play with those balances between those four different, it sounds over the top, but sometimes, as you say, to hear the clarity all the way through the scale of a bass, sometimes you need to push a little more of the, and depending on what the guitar's playing or the drums are playing, you need to push a little more of one or the other. Um, so like the crunchy, distorted sides, a little more high end, maybe you need to push that a little bit, it'll cut through on a certain drum fill. That gives you options if you do that. And it's not that difficult. You can have a direct signal that's clean and you can have a, a signal going into your amp. And, you know, I, I actually have two amps, which is, you know, pushing the budget a little more. You gotta like get, you know, have a splitter and, and put a dirty signal into the other one. But for recording purposes, that really is something that we play with that helps find the balance in each part of the, of the composition. Gotcha, okay. And what kind of strings do you use? Oh, Ernie Bull. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. uh, what gauge do you play? Well, I play, uh, well, I guess they were super slinky, right? They are, it's, they're, it's, it's uh, 45, 65, 85. And then it's supposed to be 105, but I play a 110 on the Oh, bottom. okay. I, can, right. I have to get a separate string for the, for the bottom, gotcha. just for the drop D tuning. Sure. And then uh, I also play some stuff in B, E. Which is not on this album, but uh, I, I use the five string set for that. Um, use the one, I think it's a 135 down yep. for the drop B. Okay. And then the E, I'll use a 105. I just kind of try and balance the gauge to the to the note, really. And I find it makes a massive difference. You know, it really does. If you if I play the 105 um, in the drop B, it's real real flappy. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I play with a, everyone plays differently. I play with a pick, and I hit it pretty hard. And uh, I think, you know, you just got to find what works for you. Great. You guys held out on streaming for quite a while and uh, recently released your, your collection onto all the streaming platforms. So not only do you guys have a new album, but you also have sort of uh, rebirthed all your songs into the world. Yeah. Um, after being resistant for a while, are, are, you guys, are you guys content with being in the, in the streaming world now? I, I mean, it's pretty epic. The last couple of weeks have been incredible yeah. seeing... Seeing it come out and be available um, also blows my mind that it's been kept that, uh, like the piracy of it used to be a real worry, you know, yeah. um, and somehow our stuff really never, I mean, you could get it on YouTube, you could go on there and listen to the album and stuff, but we really put a lot of effort into this release. We remastered every single album for the digital format. So we sent, you know, Bob Ludwig up in Portland, Maine, who does all our, he masters all our records. He also remastered all the old records for the digital format. Um, after having had, you know, I guess, I don't know how many years, but five or six years of, of high-end experience of mastering stuff that goes out on a digital service and hearing it back on the radio and getting feedback. So he really, you know, I think it's really the, the cutting edge of, of how good it could sound. Yeah now um and it sounds a little different you know than the original cd version um there's some pros and cons you know but you guys uh, broke some records releasing them all yeah, at once. No, a number of tracks at the yeah. top of the charts and then i think yeah fear inoculum was the first song over 10 minutes to hit the uh, was a billboard hot 100 i the think hot 100, the hot 100 say, yeah yeah yeah, yeah no awesome. i mean it's been really honestly it's been really exciting and We've we, there really was no choice at this point than to to do that. I mean, we're not selling any CDs. It's also an opportune moment to do it with our record coming out. So uh, we had a lot of uh, we we also you know worked really hard 
with the record label to make sure that we were compensated properly and you know it's, it's been a, it's been a really crazy couple of weeks i mean as far i've i've had family outs i've been distracted but I've been like going on my phone looking at the charts. I mean, it's really incredible. It's probably interesting because because all the counters get set to zero. You release all your music. I don't yeah. know if it's interesting to you to see what songs actually. Well, yeah, I know Lateralis. The, the album is still in the iTunes uh, album charts in the top twenty. It's yeah. been there for three weeks, which is really blowing my mind. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's it's exciting. You know, we just played a tour. Uh, we went to Europe and we played a bunch of festivals. We headlined them and did our own shows as well. And doing our own shows in Europe, like after 10 or 11 years or something, they're doubled or tripled in size without us actually having released anything. And this was before we released all our catalogue. So it, it's it's a, just a very fortunate moment, really, to, for everything to collide in this way. And I think... You know, you can feel the impetus with like the relief of finishing our, our new album, and like it's just all uh, it's sort of like a perfect storm, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Any tours coming up? Oh yeah, you'll find out on Friday. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Yeah, it's gonna be great. All our listeners already know. <laughs> I can't wait for it to, for it to you hear who's supporting us. It's gonna be fantastic. Oh, man, you you don't want to do an early reveal. I here? can't. You know, like I I I wanted to, but yeah. I can't. No. Yeah, I know. It's not quite not quite ironed out all the details. So. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite track on the album? Ooh, I guess it keeps changing. Um, you know, like the first track we wrote was, I guess it was descending, and once we were done writing that, you know, I never wanted to hear it again. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden. Years later, we finished the whole thing. It's actually one of my favorite tracks now. Okay. Uh, you know, I really, really love it. I, yeah, I don't know. It keeps changing, honestly. I love, I love the last track, Tempest, is really epic. It's 15 minutes long. It really combines um, me and Adam's vibe as far as like the riffs and stuff. And then it just goes off with Danny. The vocals are beautiful on it. It's it's uh, it's it's really self indulgent, but like epic, you know. Like I mean, the guitar solo is like seven minutes long. Oh, um, I can't wait! And it just uh, it's full of crazy time signature changes, but it's still it's really slamming rock song. So, and that's the last track on the album on the CD format. I think was it Lateralis? You guys, you guys put out a, a phony track list before the the album. Yeah, came? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they well, I think before that the the album before. Someone got hold of the songs, or someone released them, you know, yeah. the song titles, which is all a bit of a bummer, you know, when you're excited to just give something to the world yeah. in its entirety. Excuse me. Um, so that time we decided to uh, just make up a bunch of fake songs and actually release them so that people would think they had it, you know. Um, I think we also, we did, I remember we did a European release of, of Arnima with all our, or Arnima or one of them, with all our, our previous albums or available albums where we made up like 10 different fake albums that were available and, you know, just crazy stuff like Live at the Acropolis, Up That Old Dirt Road. Yeah, yeah, okay. Tetanus for Breakfast. Any any pranks coming up here on this new one? Uh, Not that you, I, could say. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't be a prank if I told you. <laughs> Beware, everybody. <laughs> so who are your biggest influences? Either bass players or bands? Well, I mean, it sounds like cliche but Jimi Hendrix is a huge influence on me I love the freedom in everything he did I like you know just the uncompromising awkwardness of his playing style just you know it's there's no worry about sounding perfect or it's all about pushing boundaries and just feeling feeling the moment I find that really inspiring especially no playing live uh, bass players you know most of them have passed away I mean Jimmy's gone as well but you know like uh Cliff Burton was great when I was a kid. I was like fascinated by by that. Uh, Phil Lynott, amazing, you know, Thin Lizzy. Um, I love. Uh, do you know Andrew Wise? He's played for uh, Rollins Band for a while. He oh, okay. Play, he's he's also plays for Ween and stuff. I remember seeing him with the Rollins Band. Just insane bass player, really inspiring. There was a band called the God Machine when I was a kid. I'm not a kid. I was like in London, but I was like 21. Feels like being a kid. Um, Jimmy Fernandez, he was amazing. He's gone as well. But uh, Eric Avery, Jane's Addiction, bass player, 
I mean, you can't mess with those bass lines. You know? Yeah. Uh, and then I just, you know, I, like, I mean, I could go into music. I mean, there's so much music that I like. I really like a wide, a wide uh, gamut of stuff that I'm into. Um, I like electronic music. I like, you know, uh, indie music. I like all kinds of stuff. Um, probably less of the heavy stuff, you know. I like really heavy stuff. I'm into behemoth at the moment. Um, okay. I've met I've met uh, I've met those guys recently, but I you know it sort of makes a difference when you meet people. You you get w- uh, a warm, warm welcome into their world, sure, you know? and you start to have a different appreciation for the music. Um, I like Wolves in the Throne Room. I like some of that really heavy stuff. Um, I guess they call it dark black metal, but I, I'm not concerned with categories really. I think it's kind of stupid. Sure, um, just tons of different stuff. I mean, but Wolves in the Throne Room, they were really. To me, they sound like Mogwai, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just expansive, sonic uh, stuff. And I think we get to do that in Tool as well a little bit. Real atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and then tighten up into heavy stuff. I mean, I think that's the difference that uh, we get to... We've been afforded that privilege in Tool is to do a bit of everything, you know? Um, like some really beautiful vocals on the new album... Uh, it's it's a whole different mixture of stuff that you've heard before. I'm really a big fan of music. I mean, when we're on tour, I actually I do a little DJing when we have a day off the next day. Really, I'll, I'll do a thing called Shower Club for the for the crew and the band. And uh, so, like, we have a day off the next day after everyone finishes their job. It's like one in the morning. We'll get some food in, extra booze, and I'll DJ for a couple of hours that night. Uh, which I find really fun. Where? Where would this be? At the be? venue. At, oh, okay. Yeah, so we set up at the venue, you know, and we don't have to roll out immediately because we don't have to go to another city the next day. So yeah. we'll just get like a, you know, get like a barbecue or something going. And I love doing that. I love getting in my head and just following the vibe of, you know, which is a DJ's dream, really. Yeah, you know? yeah. You, you just kind of react to the audience. What's the best and worst part of your job? Oh, my gosh. Uh, the best and worst. <sighs> the best part is playing live for sure. You know, playing a show, the real tangible thing where you stand in front of a crowd and you play exciting music and they have a great evening. You know, yeah. there's nothing better than that. Do you guys have the no cell phone rule? Yeah, we Your do. Okay. Uh, we do, we do. Um, since you brought it up, that was, we just did it in uh, Europe. Actually, we did it in, a, we did a short thing two weeks in America before that, but. Uh, I was horrified when Maynard told me, he's like, I'm going to tell everyone they can't use their cell phones and, you know, they'll get kicked out if they do. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is not, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a great thought, but this is not... There's only be, so many bands I could pull that not off. Not going to be cool with everyone, you know? And for sure, it was unbelievable. And we had an announcement going on before. Nobody did it. I mean, you, you can still see the stuff on YouTube because people have little things in their hats or whatever. But to play a show with none of that in front of your face was just epic, you know. And I think everyone else enjoyed it as well, you know. And then at the last song, he'd say everyone could take out the cell phones. Okay. So we'd do Stink Fist at the end and people could film it and it would all come up like this. It was kind yeah. of like a theatrical moment though, you know. Yeah. All the iPads come up and stuff. So is, is the reasoning, are, are you trying to help them enjoy themselves and just yeah. be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's going to, it's going to get recorded and go on YouTube or whatever, but it's a respect to us too to like actually concentrate on, on, on the experience. You know, for, you can't do that when you're looking at your phone. You know what I mean? After a, a week or so of doing it, I'm just like, man, that's genius. You know, like amazing, a really ballsy move because you don't want people to be upset. I think he did it with Pussifer or, or Perfect Circle mm-hmm. before. And he said, I'm going to do this and you'll see there's going to be a lot of hate and we're going to get some backlash, but... I really want to do it. And uh, I th- it's just distracting as well to have, you know, like that. Um, you want to yeah. see people's faces too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's, it was, that's it's just our era. Brilliant. You know, people are more worried about documenting their experiences than actually having the experience. And most of those people don't ever look at it again. You know what I mean? Like maybe for a second the next day, look at what yeah, I was it's, doing. It's a post, yeah. But some people put it on YouTube. You know, I almost have respect for those people. At least they, at least they do something with it, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. But the majority of people really don't use it for anything. Yeah. So it's just kind of a, a, a bad habit, you know what I mean? It's just a yeah. bad habit. And I think most people really enjoyed the show not having that stuff going on. That's great. I think I cut you off. Any any worst part of your job? Not really. I mean, 
No, I mean, just, you know, the, the, the business is, is tough. You have to be, I used to be, take a back seat, but you have to be responsible about that. You know, you're paying for, you're, you're responsible for a lot of people's jobs. You're uh, dealing with a lot of different aspects of, you know, f financial aspects. And, and uh, you have to be kind of responsible about it. You know, you're generating this income. You're getting a bigger entourage of people that work for you. And and sometimes it goes south, you know, and you, you hit, there's lawsuits and stuff. And it used to be horrifying, but you have to kind of be prepared for it. It's something that comes with territory. And the more you are aware of it and and uh, and get wrap your head around it and, and are prepared for it, you can actually avoid a lot of the bad stuff if you if you really take an interest in it. Great.